to you, your new best friend. Welcome. Welcome to uh, Tuesday, or if you're listening on another day, welcome to that day, too. That's the beauty of digital broadcasting. Though we go through an antenna live, breaking through windshields, smashing across freeways. It's exciting. Under bridges. That's the beauty of Think about this. This is just a little pure digital joy for me, a little mental masturbation in the amazingness of radio. You have a, let's say, a, a live stream on Facebook or here or there. You can bleed your bandwidth dry. So many people log on, and guess what? Nobody can log on. It, it fritters, it pops, it coughs, it wheezes, it gags, it splutters, it croaks. Radio has no bandwidth issue. A million, a billion people could tune into your broadcast and it doesn't diminish the signal at all. So this is pretty amazing stuff that we've got here going on in terrestrial radio. And there's a reason. I mean, not only is it built that way, but it was very useful in World War II, having just gotten through Memorial Day. It was how secret codes were sent, uh, even through mainstream BBC broadcasts and other things. Right now we use it for delicious propaganda on Voice of America. <laughs> bouncing, bouncing through the heavens, but going through bridges, going through walls, it's pretty amazing stuff. So today we're going to talk about a couple of things. Open the phones later on because I want to get your take specifically on uh, Rachel, sorry, uh, Tucker, Carl, Rachel Tucker. <laughs> we all read that book, didn't we? In eighth grade, sixth grade, whatever it was. Uh, Tucker Carlson's Racism uh, and Glenn Greenwald, who has been a hero for so many years. He's the man that brought us uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, he's the man that brought us a lot of enlightenment uh, and was one of the few willing to expose stories. Well, he is now siding with Fox News. And it's not so shocking when you consider how people on the left have treated him. I I'm on the left or I'm left of center for sure. Uh, I didn't mistreat him, but many of us who get into the fringe area, which is the same as the fringe area of the right, lose our table manners, we lose perspective, and we harangue and we're crazy and our eyeballs pop out. Well, you know, he got removed from a very brilliantly and self-created high-profile position where he was able to do extraordinary good and bring in amazing people un. Uh, unavailable to you and me in a general sense, and then just got eaten alive by the left, politically corrected. And this is something I call punching down. So when you punch up, which is good, always punch up, you punch up at those more powerful than you. But when you start punching down at people weaker than you, it's because you've already lost. It means you feel like you have no redress to your governments. You just leave uh, the politicians alone. Instead, you start politically correcting your own people. Well, you can't say that. That upsets everybody. And you keep biting and punching down and punching down and punching down. And pretty soon we're all uh, castrated, uh, male metaphor there, walking around without any backbone or spine, afraid to offend anybody. So we offend no one and we get nothing done. The needle doesn't move and we rot and decay. Let's remember where political correctness came from. Who invented that term? Who? Who do we know in history that was a big shot that invented political correctness? Stalin. Now there's somebody to like and love. There was a fine man, only killed 30 million of his own people. Well, he came up with political correctness. And if uh, you, you were politically incorrect or your politics didn't follow his, you went away forever. Gulag or just death. And we have, we, when I say we, I mean, I'm part of this club here. We have hijacked that and we nip and bite and humiliate and embarrass and force pronouns on each other and force us to comply and force us to respond and then wonder why we go nowhere. And the Republicans, meanwhile, go to the YMCA and get them all organized and go to all these social groups because they're not punching down. They're just sort of offering a benefit. And we need to think about what is that benefit we can offer? What is that benefit we can offer, whoever we are? That's it. And so far, we're not offering much but bitching at each other. Not bitching up, bitching down at each other and scalding each other as if you and I are the problem here. So in just a couple of minutes, I'm going to bring on somebody, uh, the first somebody 
Uh, we love bringing on the really smart people. This is what I love. This is not somebody who's just an average thinker, so you can hear the same old comfortable stuff. This is someone who's going to make your loafers kind of scuff. <laughs> it's going to rock at you and make you bounce a little bit around in your shoes. And your dendrites and synapses fire. Imagine that. In whatever way they still do. Uh, I love it. It keeps me from having my early onset Alzheimer's at whatever age I may or may not claim to be. Of course, being from Los Angeles, I have an age range, not a real range, just an age range. If you're not from Los Angeles, you have no idea what that means, but it's a perversion that we use culturally. We're going to talk first a little bit about guns. Oh, why would he talk about guns? Why would he talk about something relevant when we have mass shootings? We just had a few more today, as a matter of fact. Over 200 since the beginning of the year, 900 in the last, you know, why would he talk about that and not like painting your fingernails today? Why would he? Because that's the point of live radio, relevant. And we're going to talk about the Second Amendment, but is this actually part of it? Is this what the founding fathers imagined? We imagine a nation full of like duck dynasty people going out and getting even. Yeah, that's going to make it swell. Or uh, was it something else, like a well-regulated militia? What did regulated mean at the time? Regulated meant well-supplied and also limited. And guess what? Back then, they kept their guns where? In the armory, along with the bullets. Yes, well, let's just forget all about that and pretend that it was all take your machine guns home. And buy machine guns for your wife while you're at it. And get an NRA membership. All of that and more in just a couple of seconds. You can see I'm wound up. Why? Because you and I, I hate to say it, have been asleep at the switch. Asleep at the switch. Asleep at the switch. And this is what happens when we're asleep at the switch. So it's time to wake up, wake, get woke, wake up, and be part of the solution and not passively sitting in Malibu eating um, lovely watercress sandwiches while imagining the homeless self-feeding because I meditated really hard on that, but I don't want to have to move my car out of its parking space to go feed them. God, am I wound up today, but it feels great. I'm alive. It's alive. So we're going to talk about the Second Amendment, and there is an extraordinary woman whose name is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, and she's the, an author of the book called Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Huh, a title that says so much. It asks so many questions. It foreshadows so much. A chapter in her book is titled Slave Patrols. An excerpt was published recently in Truthout called United States Policing and Gun Rights Began with Slave Patrols. Now, this is where we love our mystery history, and that's my specialty. She recently talked about how the U.S. is unique in the industrialized world for the number of guns legally in civilian hands. Although only a third of the population owns even one firearm, the average gun owner owns nine firearms. Woohoo! The NRA is not just a lobby. They're actually the whole house and the basement. They're the lobby, the foyer. They're the whole soup cat and pizzas. It's a mass organization. I paraphrase there. That is not how she put it. She's much more mature and grown up in the way she speaks. But the NRA is a mass organization with chapters in every state that are Autonomous have the power to negate election candidates who support gun control. Let me just say that one again. A mass organization with chapters in every state that are autonomous and have the power to negate election candidates who support gun control. Junior ROTC exists in nearly all middle and high schools. Ding, ding, you had to go to that. And the NRA furnishes free targets, free firearms, and free training. Nicholas Cruz, the shooter who killed 17 high school students in Parkland, Florida. I happen to be in Florida today, so that's about 90 minutes from here. That was back in 2018 when Nicholas Cruz went to Parkland, Florida and um, as an expelled student from the school and had been an avid member of the JROTC or Junior ROTC or, you know, ROTC for kids chapter in the school that practiced in the school gym. He was wearing his J-R-O-T-C or j Rotz t-shirt when he carried out the shooting. Well, well, guess what? Uvalde, which is uh, said 48,000 times a day on the radio, on TV, everywhere in the newspaper today uh, for the mass shooting there, 
it also has a junior ROTC program. Well, all of that and more and why. Let's not waste another moment. Let's bring on the bigger brain in the room. Say hello to Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. I want to welcome you so much to Harrison's Reality Check. And you may be muted. We're just going to... Yeah. Aha. Aha. Thank you. I could listen to you all day. <laughs> that, you know, that's exactly the right thing to say. And I want the other listeners to go, I have to remember that. As a mantra, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> yeah, it gives me energy to hear that kind of militancy. Isn't it fun? I mean, this yeah. is one of the last spots in the world, KPFK, where you can actually do yeah. this. Or it's Clan Rally Radio on the AM stations. <laughs> and we don't even need to go there. But, but um, that does overlap and interface with the purpose of today's conversation. And in your book, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, we do get some insight into what's going on in schoolyards today. Yeah, uh, it has come to that anyway, the proliferation of guns that make it so easy for anyone who has a moment of um, resentment. Um, adolescence, for instance, uh, we all remember that stage of our lives when, um, but most people uh, who have really disturbing mental problems uh, sadly uh, commit suicide. They don't go out and shoot a bunch of people. So it's, um, you know, that's, that's one of the things, of course, NRA and other gun nuts um, always say it's mental illness, mental illness. And yet in Texas, only last week did they slash the entire mental health budget in Texas. So if they do have mental illness, what are they supposed to do? There's no mental illness treatment. But I and think- therefore no mental illness, just like no. in Ukraine and Russia, there's no gays because we declare it so and we close the gay bars. Therefore, there's no gays. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's no trans or gays. No, they're not. There's only patriarchy. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> So here's a here's a million dollar eight million dollar question. In the country of Switzerland, every male is required compulsory military service. Now, who's ever fought the Swiss military? Nobody since 1260. But they all go home with all kinds of weapons. How many school shootings? Zero. How many murders? Zero. How many anything? Zero. They're armed to the teeth, but not like hobbyists like we are. Like, that's cool. I mean, they take it home because it's their national weapon. And the idea is if they are invaded as a neutral country, surrounded by Italy, by France, by uh, Luxembourg, by Liechtenstein, believe it or not, uh, Austria. I mean, they got everybody. They're the belly button of Europe. So they're supposed to take their guns home. Yet they are not out blowing up schoolyards. Why is that? They have better brains. I mean, there's we, we know the real reasons here, and you talk about it in your book. Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time in Geneva, Switzerland, working with the UN uh, offices there on human rights. And uh, it's, uh, it's nothing to see, you know, Swiss men on, on Fridays uh, walking to the train station with a, you know, high powered weapon over their shoulder. And they're required, uh, every one of them, from 18 to, I think, 65, to uh, do that. And so it's a citizen's, you know, a true citizen's militia. Uh, they're supposed to keep three weapons in their home, a shotgun, a rifle, a high-powered rifle, and a pistol. And that pistol is usually something like a Luger, you know, a big pistol. So, yeah, and there's just no such thing as, you know, mass shootings or misuse of weapons. So there's something in the United States history, well, in no place in the world. I mean, it's not quite as extreme as Switzerland, but in no place in the world uh, do you have this kind of uh, constant, uh, this proliferation of weapons, 400 million weapons for fewer than 400 million people. But it's very important to understand that only a third of the population, and that maps with um, 
the population of, of white nationalists, descendants, most of whom are descendants of original settlers, like my family is, Scots-Irish, um, the Appalachians. So that demographic overlaps. It overlaps also quite a bit with uh, Christian evangelism, Protestant evangelism. So I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm doing a deeper study now, you know, of, of uh, Christian nationalism, white nationalism for my next book, uh, but it's completely, uh, you know, related to the gun issue. The thing is that um, the United States, these colonies of Britain were set up as settler colonial states like Ulster uh, in Ireland that they had already done where they push out the, the existing people into the periphery without land of the Irish Catholics, colonized Af Irish Catholics and bring in Scots and Welsh and Anglo settlers for free land, take their land. And they dominate still to this day. They still have wars among themselves, you know. So settler colonialism is this uh, replacing the people who are there. And that's done by extreme violence. So you said they kept their um, weapons and armories. That's not quite true of what the Second Amendment is about. That's Article 8 of the uh, Constitution itself that established state militias that now are the National Guard. They keep their weapon. They sometimes kept them in and sometimes didn't. But the militias referred to in the Bill of Rights, the Bill of Individual Rights, is the right of the white settler to um, not only have a gun, it's almost a responsibility in the colonies, but by the time the founding of the United States, it was a right because it that already existed. I mean, they everyone had these guns in their house and ammunition. And they in the colonies, they had to kind of train people to do that by making laws that required them to have uh, the weapon and a certain amount, a certain number of pounds of ammunition uh, and you know, all the things it takes to load that am ammunition in those days and have them at hand at the door when they go to the fields. Because why? They've just stolen. They've just pushed out and stolen and killed, you know, it's kind of genocidal, constant killing of native farmers. Native people were farmers, you know, 99% of the native people in the whole hemisphere, including North America, were farmers uh, within villages. So burning their crops, tearing down, raping the women, killing everyone or pushing them out. And then the native peoples are pushed into the periphery and fight to get their land back. And this goes on after the founding of the United States for a hundred years. So these white settlers are empowered to have weapons and do this themselves. There's no way an army can go in and do that. They do come in and clean up, you know, uh, uh, an area and actually often cheat these, the people out of the land who've taken it and some of them died for it uh, and pushed them out. And of course, the plantation, it's mainly plantation agriculture that it, it, with its, with slave pe uh, enslaved people uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, I'm just going to pause you for a moment because people drive around, get in and out of cars, and I just wanted to know who whose voice they're listening to right now. Carrie Harrison with you. This is Harrison's Reality Check on KPFK 90.7 FM in Los Angeles, going way south, going way north, and you can get our free newsletter at GoHarrison.com. GoHarrison.com. I've sent out a few so far. If you're just new, you'll be getting a new one too. And much of it is the kind of stuff you can't and won't hear on the radio for obvious reasons, FCC reasons, and cool and wiki wacky kind of stuff. Um, the after show, if you will, that we simply can't broadcast. And we're talking right now to Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. She is author of the book Loaded A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. And a chapter in her book, as I referenced very much earlier, is titled Slave Patrols. And Slave Patrols is where she's getting right now that 
uh, Americans, and that would include my family, 1645, uh, 1620, and my mother in the Mayflower, not Plymouth Rock, Provincetown. <laughs> I know, we're not taught that, are we? Um, and then my father's side, 1640, Kent Island in Maryland. The law in Maryland at the time was, one, you must own slaves. The law. Why? Because you're property of the King of England. You're not a person. You're property of the king. And so the king wants everybody armed so the king can, shall we say, clear cut and make it more productive for the king. So this is part of the thinking on that. And yes, as we expand, as we expand here, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, we're still property of the king and we do as the king wants or off with your head. And the king wants to remove anything that gets in the way of his chance of making more money, owning more land, and just owning more and being bigger and badder than ever. Yeah, um, slave patrols were not immediately brought, you know, when uh, the first enslaved people, 1619. It was in 1680s when um, the South Carolina colony was established by slavers from Barbados. Barbados was the most vicious slave system probably in, uh, they were all vicious, but beyond, beyond imagination. Uh, I can hardly even stand to read the documents about the kind of torture and very few slaves even lived beyond 25 years old. They uh, starved them, they, anyway, these slave owners had uh, established slave patrols that was um, other British citizens, white, who then were, um, they weren't, they were, they, they were required, they weren't hired, they weren't paid. They were required whether or not they owned slaves or how many uh, to do this, this self-organized uh, slave patrol system that all white people had to participate in. So they brought that practice to the, I mean, it's not that slavery was benign in Virginia and Maryland uh, when South Carolina uh, got established, uh, but uh, they adopted it pretty quickly. They said, this is really a good idea <laughs> that uh, what they brought here. So these militias that had already been established um, by settlers, they, uh, they could only have plantation agriculture at, after they had ethnically cleansed the native people out. So they weren't really needed uh, anymore for, you know, killing Indians, uh, but they quickly adapted them to, um, uh, uh, to be slave patrols. And at first they actually resisted because they weren't getting anything out of it. They were getting land when they killed Indians. They got to get land, but it made them kind of, um, you, you know, just uh, unpaid employees of the rich slavers. But, you know, the, with pressure, they were, and some, uh, some pay, they started paying a certain amount. And this was then developed and carried to the other, the other, uh, colonies adopted it, and then after independence, it soared with the Cotton Kingdom and the cleansing of all the uh, agricultural native people of the Southeast, that rich land that was already developed, 10,000 years of development, of calling it, of, uh, of clearing the forests, and uh, they simply appropriated that and established and, and manifest destiny taught in schools even 30 years ago. Maybe it's back. Yeah. <laughs> that God wants you to go west and, you know, make it yours. Yeah. That these, I mean, imagine being a Native American. There you are sitting there farming, as you point out. All of us think from movies and TV that they live on horses riding around with arrows 24-7. But there they are farming, you know, sitting by the brook stream. And here come these wagon trains jiggling, blowing up a lot of dust and bullets flying. Wouldn't you go, what the? F I mean, seriously, what the? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. So, so this is very interesting, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And in just a few minutes, we'll be talking to Ian Higgins uh, as we overlap into this uh, new perversion called the Great Replacement and what that mm -hmm. means. And it really is all about we're getting back to white people, taking it to the next level now, going back to the thinking of the 1800s, early 1800s. But let's give it a label and let's turn it into a, a movement here. All of us, Kumbaya and Facebook, all of us together. But before we do that, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, who's written uh, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, this for many people will be the first time They've ever heard about, you know, militias organized to dispatch Native Americans to, uh, you know, get rid of farming communities so that they could simply take over farms that had 10,000 years of beautiful enrichment. Um, boy, that soil had been tilled and fertilized, rocket ready to go. This is Home Depot on steroids. And we don't get that in the gun thinking. Likewise, if a, an African-American had taken one of these M16s, which is what they're called in the military, their AR, whatever number it is, in the schoolyard, taken one of these things into school and wiped out 15 children, would he not be a terrorist, not mentally ill, but a terrorist? White people are simply in a bad mood, you know, they... they skin their knee. I don't know. They have some terrible problem. It's not really their fault. They just had a bad day. But everyone else would be like, oh, my God, it's a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. The whole, uh, you know, colonialism is is in itself terrorism uh, of the people who are uh, subject to it. Uh, so that's really the context for the United States. But I'm really glad you're segueing into um, white replacement, uh, so-called theory um, and practice, uh, because that's the, you know, the um, desegregation, the Supreme Court decision, 1954. This was a, a big jolt to the privileged white population, even poor white people. Uh, my family is tenant farmers. Even poor white people had the privilege of whiteness. And uh, that goes a long ways, you know, it may not be economic, but in terms of dignity or a sense of, of having a, a role in the world, uh, it's, it's a, a level of arrogance and all these other people, you're above them, you're better than they are. And that was all wiped away uh, and disrupted by the civil rights movement power and then other movements, uh, that joined in huge uh, anti-racist movements and then Black Panthers and militancy. And by, by the mid 1970s, um, these right-wing groups began to form, including the National Rifle Association, which had been fairly benign. It was taken over by white nationalists. It was taken over by the Second Amendment Foundation, which a former border guard um, had um, uh, formed with other white nationalists to take over the NRA. So I consider the NRA today a white nationalist organization. And if anyone says, well, I'm a member and it's, you know, it's okay, I'm not a terrorist, uh, but you should get out of it. It's a white nationalist organization. You should get out. And now that they've brought back Wayne LaPierre, there's a name that just inspires all kinds of right. goosebumps. Um, we know where it's headed. I have to apologize to you, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, because <laughs> regrettably we're out of time, but please come back. I hope I you will. will. And we'll do part two, three, four, and eight until it's like really clear, because apparently there's only one amendment in the Constitution, and that's the Second Amendment right now, if you listen to the news or listen to anybody. So we'll focus on that for a while. Thank you so much. Where do people, how do people follow you? Well, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm easy to find by Googling. Uh, my website's down, and I'm not, you know, I'm trying to build another one, but you can find me on Facebook. Very, anyone can come on my, um, you know, Facebook page. It's totally open to the public. Okay, I'm going to say the name of your book again. It's called Loaded, colon, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. Loaded, 
A Disarming History of the Second Amendment by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. That's hyphenated D U N B A R. O-R-T-I-Z, loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment. If you Google her name, up will come uh, a, a ton of other good work she's done, and we will be bringing you back. Thank you so much for your Thank generosity you. today and bringing in a first time ever, for me too, angle on the Second Amendment. And you know, I, I like a good meal, so I appreciate your cooking. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Carrie Harrison here. This is Harrison's Reality Check. Coming up in just a minute, we're going to be talking to Owen Higgins. He's a journalist who wrote the new piece, Why is Glenn Greenwald Defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement? Two things. Glenn Greenwald was a hero to much of this audience just a couple of years ago. And what is the Great Replacement? You're hearing about it, but nobody's really explained it, maybe to you. So among the many things he's going to do is explain what that is and explain what is actually going and what is the end game. It's going to be a very powerful conversation. As we continue, don't forget you can get a free newsletter, my free newsletter that has stuff we simply cannot do on the radio, uh, simply cannot do in polite society, cannot do at my grandparents' dinner table. Trust me on that one. Free newsletter, simply go to goharrison.com, goharrison.com, sign up for that, and uh, we'll send you lots of cool goodies. Coming up in just a sec, Owen Higgins. Bullets well, still legal. Harry Harrison. Reality check. Live. Harrison's reality check. GoHarrison.com. from Pasadena Playhouse, presenting Uncle Vanya, a modern revival of Anton Chekhov's classic masterpiece, running June 1st through June 26th. After years of caring for their family's crumbling estate, Vanya and his niece receive an unexpected family visit. This translation of Uncle Vanya provides an up-close, contemporary encounter with this enduring drama. For further information on Pasadena Playhouse's production of Uncle Vanya, visit PasadenaPlayhouse.org or kpfk.org. Uh, Harrison's reality check. Go Harrison.com. And it is the top of the hour. Actually, it's the bottom of the hour. Maybe if I turn my head the other way around, I would see it's the bottom of the hour. But I like standing on my head, especially like an ostrich with my head in the sand, because my life is much more comfortable. Carrie Harrison with you. This is Harrison's Reality Check. Don't forget to get the free newsletter at GoHarrison.com. You can also follow us across all social media at GoHarrison. We were talking a little earlier with Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, author of Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment finding out that much of the Second Amendment was built around the King of England. Remember, if you came from that era, as my family did, you were property of the king. You had no agency, property of the king. Kill you, keep you alive, whatever. The king is the sovereign. And he wanted us, or he wanted, he didn't want. He ordered us to all remain armed and get rid of the folks that were in the way of getting stuff done. That would be the people who are originally here in this country. And if they do the actual genocide, it's some horrific number of like 16 million Native Americans. Unconscionable, unforgivable. And the president should be on his knees begging for forgiveness. But that's another show for another time. We delved into, we uh, flirted with the idea of something called replacement theory. You probably heard about it. You're not sure what it is because it doesn't make sense to you. 
And the fact is it's or the great replacement, replacement theory. And there is somebody who can really explain this well, a journalist by the name of Ian Higgins. And he wrote the new piece called Why is Glenn Greenwald? You'll remember him from uh, Wikipedia, from uh, much of what was very important years back. Glenn Greenwald was really quite a champion of free speech and getting it out there. He's now defending Tucker Carlson of Fox News, in case you're not a, a rabid watcher. I monitor Fox News, but I also monitor Netflix. So it's good to have a full diet so you don't get too much starch. Um, it's called Why is Glenn Greenwald, Greenwald Defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement for Salon? And reporting for the articles funded by a grant from Expose Facts Program of the Institute for Public Accuracy. We love the IPA. They are one of, they're like the station, one of the last bastions of getting it done and finding a way to pay for it. He says there's no plausible way to dispute that Fox News host Tucker Carlson is spreading racist conspiracy theories, but Glenn Greenwald has been trying anyway. This is what our guest Ian Higgins has written. And Ian Owen, I beg your pardon, Owen Higgins, I want to welcome you so much to Harrison's Reality Check. And you, you know, may be me. Um, really, uh, really appreciate being on here. And I apologize. I have 10 friends named Ian, three friends named Owen, and I've never seen your spelling, but I love it. And I will yeah, not put your Irish. name again, I promise. No, no, no worries. It's just a bunch of vowels uh, jumbled up before. It's hard it. when you have no, a, a no fun, problem. cool name and people don't pronounce it properly. Anyway, Owen, why is Glenn Greenwald defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement? First, what is the Great Replacement for people who are normal and civilized and wouldn't be thinking that way? Yeah, well, Great Replacement is a... And maybe you're muted again. Maybe not. Oh, am I? I shouldn't be. Do you hear me? Owen, can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? And not hearing you. So do you have a little on-off switch on your mic, possibly? Because you're not muted in the system. All right. KPF can not says hearing that they you can still. hear both of us, but... You were coming in a minute ago. Yeah. Okay, we're just doing uh, a little technical stuff. While he's doing that, I'm going to give you a little more background on this, okay, so that you're a little bit more warmed up. Uh, the article that Owen wrote noted that Greenwald has become a stalwart defender of Fox and Carlson, Tucker Carlson, who's now the most watched guy on cable, it turns out, uh, defending him in particular. As Carlson has gained in viewership and impact, he's the most widely watched cable news host in the U.S. Shocking. You thought it was Rachel Maddow. You thought it was once Keith Olbermann, and maybe it was for moments, but now Fox News is the full dominating force. And I could tell you that I've been in airports recently, and what's on there? It used to be CNN. It's now Fox News. Tucker Carlson's commentary and political positions have come, come under increased scrutiny. And with that attention has come intense criticism, but he has Greenwald in his corner. This is the Glenn Greenwald. The Intercept, remember, or vaguely you might remember, kind of short-lived there. Uh, he's the guy that brought us uh, uh, WikiLeaks and, and defended all of this stuff, is now hanging out with Tucker Carlson. And he's let forth a flood of pro-Carlson arguments, primarily delivered on Twitter, his medium of choice. Hoping right now that we do have e Owen Higgins back. And Owen, can we hear you maybe? Can you hear me now? No. No. <laughs> How about Owen? The station can hear, the the station can hear both of us. Let's see if your computer resets, if that's possible. Okay, you want me to, you want me to do that? Just going to log out sure. and back in. We're using multiple forms of modern technology uh, in radio, and this will interest you because we all are fascinated by radio. In radio, we used to use something called Marty Systems, where we would talk back and forth using either microwave technology, like those TV trucks you see that say Action News. And there's a big antenna poking up the top. They actually microwave a live feed 
back to the station. And we used the same thing in radio for years when we would do live remotes. That was the Marty system. And then we uh, evolved into more digital internet-based mm. ways of communication. And technology is brilliant when it works. When it doesn't, it sucks. But we're going to find out, Owen, if we can hear you. I'm here. I can hear you. Not. Well, radio, okay. Is, I'm going to watch station hear me? something super simple, Owen. Yeah, the station can um, hear me as well. Are you on Mac or PC? One finger for Mac, two for PC. One finger for Mac. Good. So go down to probably the lower left side. And you'll see. I am, a I am good. Input, I'm good on my end. You've already figured it out. All my, all my audio is good. Damn. Well, it's in, in the chat. It says it's on. Yeah. Uh, let me ask D'Angelo. Is he coming through on your end, D'Angelo? If you could just give me a, a quick reaction to that so I can see. Yes, I can hear him. No problem. I can hear you. I can hear you. He's Harris, good. can you hear me? No, it's on my end. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being patient. Owen, go ahead and talk to me. Uh, I'm here. Well, wasn't that embarrassing? <laughs> wasn't that embarrassing? I flicked a switch. I should be shot. I should be drawn and quartered. Well, I think I've just publicly humiliated myself. So I'm That's sure. That's all right. Let's are... just, let's, we'll, we'll just, we'll just get back to great replacement and we'll just, uh, Excellent. Let's just jump Go right into it. it. What is the great, great replacement? Yeah. So this is a, a white nationalist talking point, uh, which, which holds basically that a shadowy cabal of elites are attempting to replace uh, the country's white electorate, the country's white um, citizenry uh, with, with uh, non-white uh, new citizens, right? So, I, you know, either immigrants or, or you know, any any other kind of, um, you know, th this kind of it, it does go into a little bit of ideas around uh, birth rates and interracial um, marriage, and uh, it's 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 part of this uh, larger white nationalist talking point. There's um, there's there's a uh, a, a, a saying that they that they reference a lot the 14 words which which refers directly to this idea of white replacement where uh, there's this conception of uh, you know white nationalists need to protect uh, the country uh, for for their white children and so and this this meme has been percolating around for 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 decades it started being called, the Great Replacement, I think, back in 2012, uh, but uh, the the I ideological underpinning of it uh, has existed for a long time. Um, and now, if you go onto the the chat rooms and the kind of more extreme corners of the internet, uh, where 18 year old Peyton Gendron, who's the shooter in the Buffalo Massacre, uh, where he frequented, you're going to see it in uh, quite explicit terms, uh, especially. Uh, you know, it'll it'll go into the more kind of explicit uh, anti-Semitic uh, aspects of this, where the you know this this cabal of elites are are you know directly coded as Jewish. Um, it's 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 pretty nasty stuff. It is essentially what drives uh, the white nationalist project. And Tucker Carlson, uh, the Fox News host, has been kind of flirting with using a, uh, uh, I guess, a slightly differentiated version of it, where where it's kind of, uh, it's it's not said quite so explicitly uh, the way that Carlson does it. Although he does talk about they're trying to replace you, he kind of frames it as as Democrats trying to. Uh, replace white voters uh, with with voters of color who are more likely to vote Democrat, uh, but he does use a lot of similar language. Um, and so, when the uh, May Fourteenth massacre in Buffalo uh, that happened earlier this month, um, you know, people were looking at a lot of uh, what Carlson had said uh, because he is the 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 most mainstream purveyor of. 
of this talking point and, you know, comparisons between him and Gendron, even though Gendron never mentions him in the, in the manifesto that he wrote uh, are still, you know, somewhat similar. And so uh, that's kind of that, that drew a lot of heat and a lot of criticism to Carlson and, uh, and, and, and pe- people were drawing that connection. And that's when, that's when Greenwell stepped in. We're talking right now to Owen Higgins. He is a journalist who wrote the new piece, Why is Glenn Greenwald Defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement? And he wrote it for Salon. And that is a good question when people for years thought Glenn Greenwald was a glass of fresh water in a sea of polluted, turban, turbid crap. And here we see him oddly defending Tucker Carlson. Why would that be? Yeah, well, it, it's certainly been disappointing, especially for those of us uh, who, you know, followed his work through the latter uh, Bush years and through the Obama years um, and even through the Trump years. Uh, Greenwald always, you know, was he, he, even though he seems to always kind of be pretty libertarian, he, he did seem to have a lot of, of good views on on, uh, on on political topics especially talking about, you know, hypocrisy, uh, democratic hypocrisy. He's always been uh, pretty forthright on that. Uh, uh, but something did change. I think I, I would say that it changed around when he departed the intercept in September, 2020. Um, I covered that for fairness and accuracy and reporting. I interviewed him and some of the people at the intercept uh, trying to get like an idea of, of what went on there. Um, he, he had been, kind of on the outs with the website for quite some time uh, when that happened. So it wasn't a complete surprise, but it was still uh, pretty disappointing to see that, that relationship. And, uh, but then he went into onto Substack and, and, you know, kind of tried to reinvent himself as just a strict pundit. And the thing is that about, about how he reinvented himself is that he reinvented himself as a right-wing pundit, as a conservative pundit, as what is essentially now, like what I would consider him essentially now, uh, just a run-of-the-mill Fox News conservative. Really nothing particularly interesting about him other than the fact that he has the history that he has. If he didn't, uh, there would be nothing interesting about what he's saying uh, whatsoever. Uh, but what he's doing now is he's using his platform uh, to help launder Tucker Carlson's white nationalist far-right talking points into his existing audience. So he is providing entryism uh, for Carlson to his audience while Carlson is exposing him to the larger Fox News audience who then subscribe to his Substack, And then it's kind of this, this cyclical thing where- You just nailed it. Forth. But essentially, nailed. Like, yeah, essentially the reason that Greenwald is um, defending Tucker Carlson is because Tucker Carlson puts him on the TV and Glenn Greenwald loves seeing his face on the TV. That's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking to uh, Owen Higgins. He's a journalist who wrote a new piece called Why is Glenn Greenwald Defender, Defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement? We know uh, on CNN headline news, for instance, when Nancy Grace is on or any of these, all of the, the psychiatric experts that talk about why people put their fingers in certain wrong places, uh, they all get paid to make these appearances. They get paid a lot of money for it. It's showbiz. And Glenn Greenwald uh, is, has figured out the alchemy of getting highly compensated for having a good time. Um, you don't get clear, rich. To be clear, though, tell the truth. Uh, just to be clear, like uh, Greenwald has said repeatedly that he doesn't get directly paid for his Fox News appearances. And, I, and, and there's no reason to disbelieve that. But it does pay off for him as far as exposing that conservative audience to another comp- conservative provocateur. And then they go and support his work. So in a way, like it does pay off for him, but I don't think that Fox actually pays him. Yeah, well, they don't need to. (laughs) Even better, even better. Well, this is very interesting because replacement theory or the great replacement is something that is metastasizing all over the country. Um, A lot of white people, for whatever reason, do not uh, have as many children. I guess it's expensive. Maybe the concept of 180 grand to send somebody to college is four lifetimes worth of salaries and not worth it. Uh, And so they assume, like you said, there's a big cabal of everybody who isn't white getting together. They're all doing the secret handshake and saying, let's have 
lots and lots of children and just overtake the white race. Not true. They don't even know each other. They're just doing their lives. But the fact that, you know, when I was in L.A. all the time, every week, every week, and I travel a bit now, you know, I was a minority. Um, I actually liked it because I stuck out and it was kind of cool. But that's just the nature of the demographics there. And it wasn't like everybody else there was out there boinking each other to make me vanish. And that would only be some kind of narcissistic, perverse way of looking at it, like they're doing it for me. No, they're just doing what they're doing and I'm, and I'm not doing. But it works when you've got a, an electorate that's 15 to 33% of undereducated, really upset, pissed off white guys who are disenfranchised and you tell them this is what it is, well, they can get behind it, I would think. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do want to push back on that a little bit because I don't think I, I, I think that that's a convenient way to look at it, uh, to say that they're just undereducated and they don't know any better. Um, I, I, a, a lot of the people who, who buy into this, a lot of the people who watch Fox News, people who vote for Trump, um, they, they, you know, they're well aware they're they're. They're they're educated. Uh, they're they're upper middle class, middle class, upper middle class. Like you know, like the guys who, uh, who who stormed the Capitol on January sixth. I mean, you know, these these were not like a bunch of poor people, you know, like these were like you know people people who had means, and they made it out there. So this this stuff is connecting um, with with people uh, of of with white people, angry white people of of all different. Um, uh, economic and educational backgrounds. And I think that the reason that it is, is because it's speaking to, it's like, it's like answering a question that they've been asking, which is why, why is, why is the country changing in ways that make me uncomfortable? And one of those ways that makes me uncomfortable, uh, is that it's not as, as white as it was when I was growing up, essentially. And so it doesn't, so the people who are, who are buying into this, um, into, into Carlson's version of, of great replacement theory, this which is virtually indistinguishable from what, what Gendron was saying in his manifesto. Uh, but still, um, the, the people who are buying into this stuff uh, are, are, are not necessarily, um, you know, lost and, uh, you know, just have, have economic concerns that, that are then translating into in, in, into racist hate. I, I think a lot of it has to be understood uh, as this is a larger problem uh, with white nationalism and white conservatism. Uh, they can't really be just 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 pigeonholed like that. Uh, and you know, as far as like the, the forums that um, that that the shooter frequented and and Carlson's um, Carlson's rhetoric. I mean, there's a direct tie between. That that extremism and Carlson. Uh, and I had Nikki McCann Ramirez on my podcast a couple of weeks ago, and she said, "I'm going to quote it. This is in the article that I wrote for Salam. I'm going to quote it." She said, uh, "Quote: The shooter did not cite Tucker Carlson as an inspiration, as a manifesto, or as a direct source of radicalization. But what I think is important to point out here is that this man was was radicalized on online forums. Extremism researchers know that these white nationalist online forums view Carlson as an ally." In spreading their messaging to the public, so uh, the, the the people who are paying attention to what Carlson is saying are, I mean, he is the most popular cable news host in the country. So there are a lot of different uh, people from a lot of different backgrounds who who, who are listening. So it's important to uh, to be clear about that because I think that it's easy to kind of just say, oh, it's just you know, it's just this one group of people, but we can kind of. Uh, forget about that, but no, there, uh, there, there's quite a bit. I think I think he has quite a larger audience than maybe we would want uh, to admit to ourselves. Here's a question, Owen Higgins. You are a journalist. Uh, recently wrote the new piece, "Why Is Glenn Greenwald Defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement?" Uh, you pay attention to human behavior. You look at the ebb and flow of decisions. Uh, the group think, the individual think. Is there a cure for all of this white nationalism? Is there anything that the average person can do to combat it and, you know, 
douse the flames of it a bit? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that, um, I don't know if I have a good answer to that. I mean, I think that, that this, this stuff is really spreading. Um, I think that, that, that a lot of people are listening to it. Uh, you know, like the, the, the country has become more politically extreme to the right, uh, for my entire lifetime. And even before that, um, you know, this is, this has been going on for quite some time. Uh, so, I mean, I, like I trace it back to like integration really. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, people could trace it back to different things, but, uh, really like the American conservative movement is, is based on white nationalism and racism uh, primarily more than anything else. Uh, it's so it's very difficult. Yeah. It, it's very difficult to push back on it when it's so in, in, inbred into, in, into that ideology. And American liberalism has a lot of this too. I mean, I think that, I think that it, it's, it's kind of like just an ongoing, an ongoing struggle, I think for, for everybody to kind of push back on it. How do we follow you and read more of your work, more than just this? And how do we get your podcast? Sure. Yeah. So um, my, my Twitter account is probably the best place to find me. That's at Owen Higgins underscore at E-O-I-N-H-I-G-G-I-N-S underscore. The underscore isn't spelled out. It's just the the uh, the thing on the uh, keyboard there. Okay. So is that Scottish? I'm just trying to guess. Irish. Irish, E-O-I-N for Owen. I like it. Uh, so that's at Owen Higgins. I'm going to spell it out for you. At E-O-I-N Higgins. One word, at Owen Higgins. And you can follow, follow Owen Higgins. With the underscore. Unders the okay, I have no underscore here, but we're going to fix that one up. So at Owen, E-O-I-N underscore Higgins. And you can follow him across social media. Um, at thank at you Owen so Higgins underscore. Sorry. At Ogans. Oh, underscores after Higgins. Yes, you got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. I'm just reading what was sent me, but I'm going to uh, annotate this so that it's proper here. I appreciate your coming on. I appreciate your uh, talking about Glenn Greenwald because there are very few people um, in, this, in this universe on this side of the world that would mention it because it's politically incorrect. But it's important for us to know that we all have to use our critical thinking when looking at all media, any media, anywhere in the world at any time. And I think that would be your, your go-to. Yes, definitely. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. Appreciate you very much coming on. That's Owen Higgins at Owen, E-O-I-N, Higgins underscore. You can follow him around, journalist who wrote the piece. Why is Glenn Greenwald defending Tucker Carlson and the Great Replacement? Carrie Harris with you. This is Harris's Reality Check. Look forward to seeing you next week. And don't forget, you can get your free newsletter simply by going to goharrison.com. Thanks. See you shortly. Harrison's Reality Check. Support comes from Pasadena Playhouse, presenting Uncle Vanya, a modern revival of Anton Chekhov's classic masterpiece, running June 1st through June 26th. After years of caring for their family's crumbling estate, Vanya and his niece receive an unexpected family visit. This translation of Uncle Vanya provides an up-close, contemporary encounter